Welcome to the Market Beat Podcast. I'm your host, Kate Stalter. In this show, we'll cut through the noise and give you real market insights from professional investors, traders, asset managers, and analysts. Our guests will put the market developments in context and give you actionable information to make you a more successful trader or investor. Let's get started. Today, we're going to talk about commodities, you know, the metals, energy, agriculture, all of that stuff that's the inputs to what consumers and businesses purchase every day. And their prices affect the prices of just about everything else. Now, while the commodities markets are an important way to diversify your portfolio beyond traditional stocks and bonds, it's not always easy to understand these markets because they operate in a very different way from equities and fixed income that most of us are accustomed to. Now, using the Bloomberg Commodity Index as a baseline, commodities have soared in the past year with that index jumping 27%. That's its best performance in many years. And some analysts and asset managers like BlackRock believe that we are in for years of increasing commodity prices. Now, maybe that's not all good news for consumers or business owners, but for investors, there are ways to capitalize on this trend. And today's guest will help us out with some very actionable ideas. Today, I'm speaking with Carly Garner. She's a commodity broker and analyst at DeCarly Trading, and she's the author of several books, including Trading Commodity Options, Higher Probability Trading, and A Trader's First Book on Commodities. And she's a frequent guest on None Other Than Mad Money with Jim Cramer. Carly's got a lot of info for you today. Let's get to it. All right. So, Carly, glad to have you joining us today. One of the things that I wanted to jump in immediately and, and ask you about, I wrote an article for Market Beat a couple weeks ago, and it was focusing on some of the fertilizer makers, of all things, of CF and Mosaic were a couple of the ones I talked about. And one of the key elements in their earnings report, they are paying more for their commodity inputs these days. And I think that's been going on for several months, actually. Now, their revenue and earnings are going up, even though their unit costs are down because they're passing along the increased costs to their customers. But I wanted to get your take on that. Is this the kind of phenomenon maybe you're seeing right now? And how long do you think this might last? Sure. This is absolutely a topic that uh, a lot of my customers and clients, particularly hedge clients, are talking about. And uh, believe it or not, a lot of the farming community every year they decide how much they are going to plant, how many acres they're going to dedicate to corn and how many to soybeans. And it's really a big argument this year because fertilizer costs are so much higher than they normally are. Uh, it's more expensive to fertilize an acre of soybeans versus an acre of corn. So there's a lot of speculation on what farmers are going to plant more of this year and what that's going to do to ending stocks at the end of the year. So it actually is creating a good amount of volatility and confusion in the, in the futures markets. So we talk about it all the time. The, the primary driver of the fertilizer costs has been natural gas. Natural gas had a crazy run earlier this year. It basically went from, uh, well, it started in the low $3 and ended up peaking out at around six fifty. dollars and so more than doubled in value in a very short amount of time. And that really ramped up the, the cost of fertilizer. The good news is natural gas has recently sold off pretty sharply from the highs. I actually, this is on a side note, I actually think natural gas probably goes back up, but uh, we'll talk about that later for now. Um, natural gas is almost half of what it was earlier, let's say in the, the late fall, when fertilizer prices really took off because natural gas prices took off. So there is some relief down the pipeline, but it's just like anything else. We notice it, you know, when we fuel our cars, uh, just because the futures market drops 10% in gasoline futures or oil futures or whatever it is, doesn't mean that the price at the pump is going to budge. It's a process. It takes some time for those price changes to filter from the cash market and the futures markets down to the actual uh, consumers and the end users. But I think there is some relief on the horizon. Well, yeah, you make a good point is that this is manifesting in several areas. So people might be paying more for food 
for some of mm -hmm. these reasons. And we're already seeing reports of that. And as well, you're saying this could eventually make its way to higher prices at the pump. And I know that's been fluctuating already throughout the course of this year. And it depends on where you live, for one thing. But you can kind of see it in several ways just as a consumer, can't you? Absolutely. The one thing I want to point out, though, is in my now, nobody has a crystal ball. No one knows what the price of oil is going to be next year or next month or even tomorrow. But um, I've been doing this a long time and I've seen a lot of things. And in my opinion, I feel like we're in a situation where most of the um, commodities are at around the, the highest levels that we will probably see. Like, in other words, crude's at around $80. I don't think we're going to 100 I think this is probably the upper end of the trading range. And we probably taper off from there. Uh, now, that's important because if crude oil stops going up, then prices at the pump may not necessarily go down, but they should at least stop going up. And that's, I think, welcome news for all of us. And over time, that will eventually... Um, prices at the pump will start to reflect what we see in the commodity markets. But again, it's a, it's a very slow process to the actual price of commodities going down and then consumer prices actually following suit. And, you know, a lot of people try to point towards price gouging and things like that. that but the reality is if you're a business and you've experienced prices go from low to high, like we did recently in energies, energies went from uh, literally crude oil was under $20 a barrel. And in some cases, almost zero or negative if you really want to get technical about it. And then we've come to 80. So as a, a you know, somebody that is uh, running a business that depends on stable pricing is experiencing that kind of volatility, they're going to be really slow to change the prices that they offer their customers because they don't want to put themselves out of business in the process. So it's not price gouging. It's just, uh, we're all trying to survive here. And some, the last couple of years between COVID and, economic stimulus and all these things have really created a lot of things in the markets that we weren't prepared for, we've never seen before, and is wreaking havoc on businesses and consumers. So it's, it's going to take some time. Hopefully, these things start to work themselves out here in the next year. That's a really good perspective on that. I appreciate that. Now, you had mentioned natural gas prices. And one thing I was noticing is that the futures have been a little higher this week. And I know that's like one data point. That's a blip. You can't really extrapolate any kind of trend from that. But what are you seeing and how should investors, let's kind of put on the investor hat here for a minute, because that's who our audience is. Is this something that investors or traders should be trying to take advantage of at this point, the fluctuations in the natural gas prices? So the volatility that we've seen in natural gas has been incredible to the point where uh, earlier this year, we were seeing moves that take place in a couple of hours that were larger than moves that took place in the previous two years. So, so the volatility wow. has been insane, to be honest, for most, uh, most retail speculators, which is what we deal with. It, it's been a lot to handle. And, and unfortunately, not everybody can, can keep up with that kind of volatility. And I even know some of the, uh, there's been a, a handful of really big traders and even funds that have mostly wiped out on this kind of volatility just because they weren't properly hedged or they got caught on the wrong side and, and things happen so fast. If you make a mistake, there's not a lot of room for error. So I would say uh, at this particular time, natural gas is not necessarily, and I should also preface it by saying natural gas is not like, let's say the stock market that generally goes up over time. I mean, there's pullbacks, but the stock market in the long run, has always gone up and it's uh, paid dividends and all kinds of fun things. In natural gas, it's a little bit different. Uh, and in co commodities in general, it's different. They don't naturally go up, even with inflation. I mean, it seems crazy because everybody thinks that over time with inflation, commodity prices should always go up. And that's actually not the case. They actually trade sideways in very wide trading envelopes. So, uh, you want to be real careful in commodities. It's not the kind of thing where you buy and hold for three years or five years. It's not like that. If you're going to trade or invest in a commodity, whether it's natural gas or oil or whatever the case is, uh, you don't set it and forget it. You, you, you have to pay attention to it. So with that said, I would say there are some opportunities on the upside in natural gas. There's some good fundamental stories there. We have we're still in the learning process of figuring out how to liquefy natural gas and export it to other countries. And the reality is, we have more natural gas than we know what to do with in in the United States, uh, or at least we did when 
when we were a little more aggressive at fracking, but we still have plenty now. And the reality is overseas, that's not necessarily the case. In Europe, natural gas prices are much higher than what we pay here. And uh, they don't seem to have a whole lot of relief coming down the pipeline. They rely almost almost solely, I don't want to say solely, but primarily they rely on Russia and Vladimir Putin for their natural gas. That uh, is not the most ideal situation to be in. And what it, you know, what it does is create price volatility and quite frankly, a little bit of panic as well. It puts upward pr- pressure on their prices. So as long as prices in Europe are high, natural gas in the U.S. should continue to grind higher, in my opinion. Also, uh, market positioning has been interesting. If you look at the reports from the CFTC, which is the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, speculators are very heavily short in natural gas and very very heavily long crude oil. Most people would look at that and think that that's bullish for oil and bearish for natural gas, but I actually look at it and see the opposite because if traders are already positioned and they're already in overcrowded trades in one one way or the other, that means they've probably already taken action. So anybody that wanted to be short natural gas is probably already in. Anyone that wanted to liquidate any long holdings has prob- probably already done so. And so quite frankly, what happens when you get in- into a situation like that is all the, the selling dries up because there's no one left to sell and the path least resistance turns the other way. And I think that's exactly what we're seeing now. So you, you mentioned it's only a week and that doesn't make a trend. And I agree with you, but uh, actually, I think that we're. This is the the budding, uh, the beginning of a nice trend. So let's see what happens. You know, you mentioned that even a lot of the professional traders had gotten wiped out. How do you educate retail investors when even maybe you know, a lot of times we're told, "Well, follow the professional money, watch what they do." But if they're making mistakes, how do you go about educating retail investors <laughs> to use some caution here? Right. That's that's a wonderful question. So a few things to keep in mind. The great thing about commodities is we can see, and this is unlike anything that happens in the stock world. In commodities, we can see the government actually puts together reports every week that tells us who's long and who's short. Um, They separate it into certain categories. For example, we can see if what commercial hedgers are doing, and we can see what large and small speculators are doing. And the human tendency is to look at what large specs are doing and say, assume that, hey, those are people that have a lot of money. They probably know what they're doing. And so if they're going long, I want to go long too, right? That's what the that's what our, our human uh, instinct would tell us. Mm-hmm. But there's some things to keep in mind there. If large speculators or the big guys or the funds, whatever you want to call them, if they're going long in a market, they probably have a lot more room for error than the average speculator. So they can their timing doesn't have to be perfect. They have deep pockets. They can ride out if their timing is not perfect. Whereas the the average retail speculator either runs out of money or just simply uh, can't take the pain anymore and, and ends up getting flushed out of markets. When you see big spikes up and spikes down, sounds really mean to say, but that's exactly what's happening is is the weak hands are getting flushed out and it's very unfortunate. And I, I hate to see that obviously, but it that's just how markets work. What we've done with our brokerage is we try to encourage people to always hedge with options. So if they're trading futures long or short, they can buy or sell options around it to hedge. That way they don't have to worry about stop loss orders. Now, I know I've, 99.9% of the people are going to tell you to trade with stops. And I totally get that because it's a risk management technique. Because if you do get caught without any type of protection on the wrong side, it can get ugly quickly. But we try to uh, encourage people to use options instead. And the reason being, you don't have, like, if there is a big price spike one direction or the other, hopefully you can ride it out and survive. So, for example, if you get stopped out and you're sitting on the sidelines, but the market ends up going your way, uh, there's two things you could do. You could either watch it and feel bad for yourself or you can chase it. And then you're probably going to feel bad for yourself again if you're chasing prices doesn't work out well most of the time. So with options, at least it gives you some some wherewithal. But uh, I also always tell people play defense first and then worry about playing offense because the reality is this is not easy. I've seen people that have traded for 20 years make one or two mistakes and and uh, really put themselves in a bad situation. So it can happen to anybody, especially when you're talking about leveraged commodities. So always play defense first, then worry about offense. Yeah, I like that approach using a lot of risk mitigation right up front. 
Right. Let's turn to gold and silver. That's something that everybody always wants to talk about. Now, these asset classes underperformed last year. And of course, we had equity markets perhaps outperforming in, in terms of perhaps what might have been expected. What do you see for gold and silver and precious metals in general for this year and why? So you're absolutely right. The commodity dogs of 2021 were gold and silver. And I think it, it, I like the, you brought up the point that the stock market probably over outperformed most expectations. And I think that's a big part of why gold and silver underperformed. I think investors just felt like they didn't need them anymore, right? They don't need any kind of hedging. Why do you need to hedge when stocks only go up? We saw the same type of situation in treasuries. Nobody wants to own treasuries anymore uh, because, first of all, the yields are low. But second, they're generally used as a portfolio diversification tool. And if stocks only go up, you don't need that anymore. And so that's how people are looking at things. I actually, believe it or not, um, I think that we're probably seeing peak pessimism when it comes to gold and silver, as well as treasuries. I think all three of those markets are going to have a great year simply because everybody is so under allocated. At some point, if stocks go into a more normal course of action where they do have corrections, people are going to remember that having a hedge isn't so bad and having some sort of diversification isn't so bad. Uh, a couple of things I'll bring up on the metals. Most people expect if stocks are going up, metals will go down and vice versa. It's really not that simple. That's not how it works. In fact, a lot of times gold and stocks go up together. So I don't want anyone to, to think that I'm saying gold's going to outperform if the stock market underperforms. That's not what I'm saying, but it is a great diversification tool because it does get you into an asset that is uh, not necessarily correlated with stocks, either positively or negatively. I mean, it goes through uh, cycles where it's either, but it's not It's not one of those all the time. So it's a diversifying tool. And let's face it, gold and silver, when they do decide to go up, it can be pretty spectacular. So mm -hmm. there's definitely a lot of upside potential there. I would say not something, anything that I, I would never tell anyone to put a giant piece of their portfolio in, into any type of metals trading or speculating or investing. But I think it's worth a shot if you're looking for something, just something different other than stocks that, uh, again, helps to diversify. And you know, when I was managing money, I would always talk to my clients about that using gold, for example, just as another diversification tool, just another asset class. But you know, you said something that I found all the time as well, is that people would expect if the stock market goes down, I better have gold to protect me. And you're absolutely <laughs> right. It did not always work that way. It doesn't. An interesting thing is what you tend to find, especially now more than ever, with because uh, people have so much access to their trading accounts or their investment accounts to liquidate. I mean, back in the good old days, you'd have to call your broker, and then your broker might have to call somewhere to for you to liquidate your mutual fund. I mean, it was like this big process. Now people simply have a button on their phone or their computer to liquidate anything that they have in their account. So that's good in some ways, and it's bad in other ways. What it does tend to do is when things start to go sour, whether it's it, who knows what market's going to get hit first. It might be stocks or maybe it's commodities like crude oil, some of the risky commodities, whatever it is, if, if something starts selling off and everything else follows, guess what? Gold and silver, um, they tend to go along for the ride. If you look at March, 2020, gold and silver both had, I hesitate to use the word crash, but honestly, that's kind of what it was. It was like a crash along with stocks. And then eventually people realized, uh, okay, so I've raised cash. I've gotten you know, I've gotten to the sidelines and everything. Now, let me think about what I want to have my money in. And gold and silver were winners at that particular time as we went forward. But yeah, so I mean, we'll see. It's, uh, I, I will also point out that the turn of the year tends to have uh, the ability to reverse trends. So gold and silver have been really sluggish in 2021. Uh, they've, they're starting to look a little better here early in the year. And a lot of times, if you look at gold or silver charts, you'll see they tend to turn around in December or January. So, so far, so good on the seasonals. I think if we can break above uh, maybe like 1850 in gold, I think we might have something. So that's what we're looking for. Yeah. And I'm just pulling up the chart of the gold ETF here, the iShares Gold Trust. Mm -hmm. 
And yeah, you know, we're seeing a little bit of flatlining here, but, mm-hmm. but uh, you know, maybe a tiny little bit of an uptrend, but maybe it's going to take yeah. an asset class like this one a little longer to catch up, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, the upside on these rallies that we've seen over the last couple of days or even a couple of weeks has, it has really been uh, disappointing. I'm not going to lie. But what I'm noticing in gold and silver is every time it does sell off, it is holding support levels and that's important. So eventually the sentiment is really, really bearish in metals. Everyone's kind of given up. I think the worst thing that happened to silver was almost exactly a year ago. This is going to sound a little bit crazy, but uh, it was like February of 2021. And there was, remember, this is when all the meme stock stuff started going on Mm -hmm. the GameStop short squeeze. Well, uh, a group of traders on the internet, I I don't think, I think it was maybe started in that Reddit thread that did GameStop or anyway, it doesn't even matter. Uh, Everybody got this idea that they were going to short squeeze, short squeeze silver (laughs) to force JP Morgan out of, out of uh, business. That was this idea that was going all over the internet. That's brilliant. Yeah. yeah. And so I was, it was a little nerve wracking because we were short yeah. a bunch of silver calls going into the weekend. And this mm-hmm. thing, this internet thing took hold over the weekend. And I started getting alerts from like the wall street journal about this short squeeze that was going to happen <laughs> in silver. Mm-hmm. And I lost a little sleep about over it for, but the reality was it, they did squeeze it for like a day and a half and it traveled. I think silver moved like three or four bucks in a very short amount of time. And then after that, it's just been, uh, it hasn't been able to get out of its own way since then. It's just been really, really weak. But the fact that nobody uh, has any confidence in it, I think all the weak bulls are out. Again, I think we're just kind of running out of sellers here. And that's usually when markets make their move is when people least expect it. If you remember last year about this time, nobody thought oil was going anywhere. All we heard was lower for longer, lower for longer. And that's what I'm hearing in gold and silver right now is nobody thinks it can go anywhere. Well, guess what? Oil is at $80 and uh, gold and silver could very easily make their way higher. So we'll see. Nothing wrong with a little contrarian viewpoint, is there? (laughs) Right, exactly. Yeah. Hey, so I was talking about the gold ETF a minute ago, and I do want to ask you about indexes versus single stocks versus commodities futures. I mean, I noticed something just the other day, uh, I believe it was yesterday, that there was a company called Talon Metals that is traded on the Toronto Exchange, and that was up because of news that Tesla was going to source nickel and cobalt and iron ore from this company. Now, that's one way, certainly, that investors who are interested could jump on a stock like that when there's news. There's also ETFs. But I know that the problem with some of the commodities ETFs is that they're not all created equal. You know, you think if you're Mm -hmm. buying the SPY versus the IVV, well, you're getting the same thing. You're getting the S&P 500. And it doesn't really work that way in the commodities world. So what do you think about gaining exposure in either one of those ways, as opposed to what you're doing with your Mm -hmm. clients? For full disclosure, I am a futures broker, a futures and options broker, which means I don't re- our business doesn't deal in ETFs or stocks. And so for that reason, I'm probably a little biased <laughs> towards <laughs> futures. So I just want to lay that out there. But I will say ETFs in general, commodity ETFs is what I'm talking about. They are generally are very, very inefficient. So um, there's, there's a few good ones. For example, the gold and silver ETFs, GLD and uh, SLV, those are actually backed by actual gold and silver, but most commodity ETFs, for example, USO, which is crude oil, they're kind of mimicking a commodity pool. They're basically taking investor money and then buying and selling futures contracts and and uh, and doing it that way. And they're really, they tend to be horrible when it comes to actually following the underlying commodity. So for example, crude oil might be up 10%, your ETF might only be up 1%, vice versa. Those kinds of weird things happen because the ETF itself has to constantly rebalance its futures positions. And as we learned in USO last year, actually two years ago, almost a year and a half ago, it actually, believe it or not, USO blew up the crude oil market. When crude oil went negative on the front month, a lot of that was liquidation from the ETF. And so it can get really, really hairy. So I'm not a fan of commodity ETFs in general. That said, you mentioned, I'm not familiar with the uh, Talon Metals that you mentioned, but- Yeah, it's a small company. It was just in the if, news because Tesla's buying from okay. them. Yeah. 
I mean, with that said, if you're if your goal is to get access to nickel or cobalt or some of the the more um, obscure commodities, that's probably a better bet than the futures market. Because in the futures market, liquidity stops once you get past gold, silver, copper, platinum, and palladium are questionable. They're, the futures are liquid enough, but beyond that, there's really, I mean, everybody. Uh, I get a lot of calls all the time. People want to trade, you know nickel cobalt those types of things there's really no futures contract that'll that'll do that for you not one that you can efficiently buy or sell the great thing about the futures side of things is though they are offering micro futures in some of the products now for example there's a micro gold which is which is a very very small contract so it gives people the ability to take advantage of the efficiencies of the futures markets which are 24 hours tax benefits uh, mm -hmm. type bid and ask that futures contract follows gold because it's deliverable against gold. So it's not like a product that's mimicking another product. It, you're literally trading the price of gold. And it's a, the micro is a 10 ounce contract. So you're not going to probably not going to lose your shirt on it. You're probably not going to get rich either. But just to give you an idea, like the margins about $800 for one contract and it, it represents about $18,000 worth of gold. So as opposed to buying bullion and storing mm -hmm. it and shipping it and all those costs, you could just buy a single futures contract. It's margin of 18 of 1000 uh, if you want to eliminate all the leverage which is not a bad idea cuz leverage can work both ways if you just fund an account with 18000 by one micro and you've eliminated all the leverage and you have all the efficient efficiencies of being long gold and you can mm -hmm. just see what happens I like that plan a lot. You know, I want to wrap up here and I want to just tell you a quick story about a client that I had a few years ago. And she had wanted to invest in gold and the way she did it was with bullion but she forgot about it. And then when her son was cleaning out the garage, she was like tripping over all these suitcases she had with the bullion. And, you know, and she was like, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. It's, it's like, well, you don't want that. You do not want that. No. And it's not easy to sell. Like you, even if gold, you buy it and gold goes up, it's not all that easy to actually turn it into dollars that you can use. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. You got to go out and find the buyers, right? Not yeah, just push right? a button. Exactly. Yeah, that's interesting. Oh, that's great. <laughs> hey, Carly, thank you so much. I've learned a lot. I think our listeners probably have too. Tell the listeners how they can get a hold of you if they're interested in learning more. Well, thank you for having me, Kate. Uh, if you're interested in learning, we have a lot of free videos and articles and educational material on our website. It's decarlytrading.com. That's spelled D-E-C-A-R-L-E-Y trading.com. And if you're on social media, you can check us out on uh, my Twitter handle is at Carly Garner. I'm also on Instagram and Facebook. All right. That's great. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Market Beat podcast. You can find the show on all your favorite podcast players, Stitcher, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many others. Every week, we'll be bringing you top market experts to give you actionable ideas. And if you enjoy the show and are learning from it, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. That helps others find the show and learn right along with you. Thanks again, and we'll catch you next time.